Money for people. Order, Senator Roberts. You'll be in continuation when debate resumes. Questions without notice, Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. How many years has the coalition government presided over record low wages growth? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Gallagher for her question. Uh, the government, uh, which, uh, which we have been proud to serve and deliver for Australians a strong economy uh, in the lead-up uh, into this global economic crisis, pandemic-induced crisis that we face, uh, has worked tirelessly to create more employment opportunities for more Australians and have achieved that in record levels. Uh, we acknowledge indeed during that time that uh, inflationary factors, including wage factors, uh, have been at relative lows. They have been at relative lows both together, noting that the inflation factors have also been at lows, and so uh, nominal wages growth uh, has been at lows alongside low inflation growth. Uh, but what our government managed to achieve, Mr President, in the run-up to the last election was growth of one and a half million extra jobs in Australia. One and a half million additional jobs for Australians, giving them Order. every opportunity. Senator, Senator, Senator Birmingham, uh, Senator Gallagher, on a point of order. Point of order is relevant. It was I, no I, I, I'm actually trying to hear the point of order. I didn't. There was, there was no any... preamble, Mr. President. It was a very direct question about wages growth. How many years? Have they presided over record low wages growth, and the minister should be relevant to the question. Um, I can't instruct the minister how to answer a question, nor the terms in which he can answer it. When the minister, oh, I've allowed you to remind the senator, minister of the question, Senator Gallagher, when the minister is talking about wages growth, and I would contend that includes being able to glance across, as he just was, issues of the labour market, as long as he relates it to wages growth. He can't be, I cannot instruct him how to answer a question or the terms in which to answer it, but talking about wages growth is directly relevant to the question. Senator Wong. If that were the case, we would agree, but he's not. He's talking about and jobs I, and other economic parameters, and, and, and I, a glancing, if I may, my submission is, a glancing reference uh, doesn't then justify a range of material which is simply not relevant to the question. Okay. Um, in my view, Senator Wong, the minister was, to use the colloquial phrase, glancing across. I, I heard him turn to this just around the one minute mark, so less than 15 seconds in a two minute answer. I do consider to be glancing across issues of the labour market when they're made directly relevant to the issue of wages growth. I will listen carefully and let the minister continue. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, th thanks, thanks, Mr. President, and, uh, and indeed, Mr. President, I'm more than happy to talk about wages as well as jobs. The two are firmly connected. Now, real wages have increased in Australia over the past year. Wages price index growth of 1.4 per cent has in outpaced inflation of 0.7 per cent. I was pointing out earlier in the answer, Mr. President, in addressing this is that inflation rates have been at incredible lows. And so with inflation low, Order. unsurprisingly, Mr President, so too have associated wages rates. But, Mr President, what we have done and what achieved the economic strength for Australia was achieve record jobs growth, Order. which of Senator course feeds Birmingham, into wages. The answer pressures. has expired. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. <laughs> Thank you, Mr President. Yes, I do have a supplementary. On Tuesday, the RBA governor warned of, and I quote, subdued increases in wages and prices over coming years. Will Australian workers have to endure a decade of low wages growth under this government? Senator, will, oh, sorry. When will growth return to trend? My apologies. Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, it's important, and I thank Senator Gallagher for at least um, using uh, all aspects there of a quote recognising that the RBA governor was noting anticipated low prices growth as well. So low prices growth, low inflation environment uh, does of course mean that you would well those those opposite like to come in here and of course what they frequently seek to do is talk about the nominal rates and the nominal rates in uh, in relation to wages. We face at present a global economic situation quite unlike 
quite unlike anything the world has seen in the last hundred years. Our country has responded more strongly and better than most. But we acknowledge there remain difficulties across the economy for many businesses, for many households. But yesterday's growth figures, welcomed by the RBA governor, who you quote, who has endorsed strongly the approach the government has taken in terms of our policy settings, are all about getting people back to work and driving Order. growth Senator across Birmingham. the economy. Senator Gallagher, a final uh, supplementary thank you. question. Thank you, Mr. President. Given that the government has prioritised spending uh, $15 million worth of taxpayers' money congratulating itself on its so-called comeback marketing <laughs> campaign, when will Australian families, under mounting cost of living pressure, finally experience a wages comeback? Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, our absolute focus is, uh, is on driving strong economic growth across the economy to get growth in all quarters for all Australians. And our focus and what we are achieving in that regard has clearly been about getting the growth that delivered yesterday impressive economic figures for Australia, economic figures uh, that demonstrate yet again our country is outperforming much of the rest of the world. We went into this pandemic in a stronger position than much of the rest of the world because we had been outperforming in terms of jobs growth, because we had outperformed in terms of budget management. We went in with, with resilience and strength, and we are now coming through this pandemic in a better position than most of the rest of the world, not just on the health outcomes, but on the economic outcomes, which are closely tied to one another. And so, Mr President, we clearly are committed and will continue to implement the policies that deliver the economic growth like Order, that we Senator saw yesterday. Birmingham, Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister please update the Senate on what the Morrison government is doing to remove barriers to employment for people with a disability? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and thank uh, Senator Hughes for her question. Uh, well, the Morrison government is absolutely committed to challenging um, misperceptions about people with disability and promoting a more inclusive Australia. In this financial year alone, we will be spending around $34 billion on programs and services to support and improve the lives of Australians who live with disability. And today, being International Day, uh, of people with disability, it's timely to reflect on the contribution of the more than 4.4 million Australians who live with disability. It's about celebrating their lives, their achievements and their contributions. It's also an important opportunity to, to mark the contributions that people with disability make to the workforce uh, and to focus our attention on making sure that we change the attitudes of our employers so that they understand that people with disability can be a really strong asset in so many businesses around our country. So I'd encourage employers, not just today but all year round, to see the ability in disability and hire based on what people can do and in doing so improve the job um, uh, opportunities uh, for people with disability and understanding that people with disability are missing out on jobs because people just don't think this needs to change. And today can I acknowledge the pin that I am wearing uh, was designed by Oliver Mills and I noticed that a number of my other colleagues are wearing it too. He's a 32-year-old man from Adelaide who lives with cerebral palsy, epilepsy and vision impairment. But that's only a small part of Oliver's story. He's also written four books. He's an artist, a poet and a speaker. Yeah, yeah. And we cannot overlook these talents and experiences of people like Oliver and the contribution that they make to Australian society. So today, on the day of International Day for People with Disability, I encourage everybody, I encourage our communities, our workplaces, our schools to participate in International Day of People with Disability. Order, and Senator Rustin. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Can the minister advise how the Morrison government's 2020-21 budget is helping people with a disability to get into the workforce? Senator Rustin. Mr President, well, we are investing more than $3 billion into disability employment services over the forward estimates. Uh, a change is announced in just in this uh, recent budget mean that investment in disability employment services will be better targeted working to assist job seekers 
uh, most in need of specialised assistance to ensure that they can be supported in the workplace. Uh, we're also investing an additional $45 million in the Individual Placement and Support Program, um, which will now expand out to 50 sites across Australia. The IPS program uh, co-locates vocational and other support services with youth mental health services through the Headspace program. And it focuses on the need of young people, uh, making sure that we support them uh, either remaining in education or getting into employment, uh, and making sure that the young people are accessing the services that they need to enable them to be able to do that. So by offering early support, we hope that we'll be able to set up these people for a lifetime. Senator Hughes, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. What is the government doing to support people with a disability that are employed within the Australian Public Service? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, we all know that a, that a job is an absolute game changer in anybody's life, and it shouldn't be any different for somebody with a disability. Um, as a nation, we need to rise to the challenge of improving the employment outcomes for people with disability, and that starts with the Australian Public Service setting an example. Uh, so the Australian Public Service um, currently uh, employs 4 per cent of people with disability, but I'm really pleased to say that the department of which um, I have the, uh, the pleasure of being the minister, uh, that figure sits at 6.8 per cent. And today um, I'm pleased to announce that we've released the new Australian Public Service Employment Strategy to make employing people with a disability a mainstream activity in the culture of the Australian Public Service. And only this morning I had the pleasure of meeting Nick and Gordon, two fantastic young men who work at Services Australia. And in speaking to their supervisors, they said that they are some of the best employees they have had and their work is outstanding. Senator Wong. Thank you. Thank you, Mr President. On Monday, Oh, sorry, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. On Monday, the Minister said that as soon as the Government became aware, and I quote, that the method of debt collection was not valid, we immediately ceased collecting funds. End quote. Can the Minister advise on what date the Morrison Government first became aware that the method of debt collection was not valid? The Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and, and I thank um, Senator Wong for, for her question. Um, and just in the interest of being absolutely clear about what I said on Monday, and, and I, accept the, I accept the direct quote that Senator Wong has just read into the Hansard, but what I would say is what I said on Monday was that income averaging was deemed to not be a valid method by which to determine a debt. Um, and so we just need to be very clear that it was not what Senator Gallagher alleged that I had said, and that was that the income compliance program was not valid. So just to be absolutely clear, absolutely clear. Um, but um, Senator, Senator Wong, as, uh, as is always the case uh, in this place, um, we do not, uh, you know, it, and it's been the, the practice of, of everybody, whether it be the Labor governments or successive Liberal governments, that we do not provide details in relation to specific legal advice. However, I do stand by my statement that, um, that as soon as we were made aware, we acted with great speed to make sure that Order. we did not continue to use Order. income averaging as the sole method by which we would determine debts. In fact, we made it very, very clear um, that we would um, make sure that we had further proof points uh, in determining um, if, uh, a debt, uh, if a debt was raised. And so that the, to ensure that the income compliance program um, was uh, collecting or was determining debts by a valid means. And as I subsequently went on to say during the week, uh, that we uh, am, have now this year um, proceeded to uh, repay the debts that were, uh, that were generated through uh, income averaging as the sole means for collecting those debts. We have now gone through the process um, of repaying the majority Order. of the debts that were determined by that means. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Supplementary question, and I refer to the minister's answer. I'm not seeking legal advice. The minister herself has made a public statement, including to this chamber, uh, that the method of debt collection was not valid. She herself has indicated that. I'm not going to the substance of legal advice. I'm asking this government 
when you became aware of the method of debt collection being not valid? What was the date? Senator Rustin. Thank you very um, much, Mr President. Um, Senator Wong would be well aware that the matter that we are referring to is actually still before the court. And for me to come in here and to provide information not only um, about the legal advice but the dates when it was received. Um, however, what I can tell you is that, um, that um, last year uh, that we made a decision that we would, uh, we would include an additional uh, proof points to enable us to make sure the method by which da, uh, debts were calculated uh, was, within, was, was valid, and that was undertaken at that time. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Can the minister explain why this government ignored warnings over three years prior to late 2019 and at least 76 AAT decisions? and continued with a method of debt collection which was not value, valid. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, I reject the premise of the question that Senator Wong just put to me, um, because as I have said in this place, when I became aware, or the government became aware, that the method of the income averaging as a method for determining uh, debts was not a valid means by which to, uh, to determine those Order. debts, we changed the program to ensure that we did not continue to be, collecting, uh, to be determining debts by this invalid method. Um, however, when you go back to the comments in relation to the AAT, as I've said in this place this week on a number of occasions, Senator each O'Neill. and every case that goes before the AAT turns on the specific facts of that case. Um, there were cases before Order. the AAT uh, that were, were upheld, and there were also cases that went before the AAT. Sorry, that Senator Canavan, on a point of order. Look, on a, on a point of order, Mr. President. Um, and this has been happening all week. Um, I, I, it's hard to hear the answer to this question with Senator O'Neill's constant interjections. And I, I would like to be able to hear interjections equally. I can't hear Senator Keneally's interjections over Senator Order. O'Neill's interjections. And I think it would only be Order, fair Senator that they would give an equal opportunity Senator to Canavan, interject thank you. on these Order. important questions. Order. Order. Senator, I'll, I'll take Senator Wong on this or another point of order, Senator Wong. On this, point, on this of point of order, Senator Wong. Uh, on this point of order, I would have hoped Senator Canavan might care a little more about the fact that this minister is entirely refusing to be accountable Senator Wong, to the that's chamber. not a point of order. That is not a point of order. Um, interjections, I will restate, are always disorderly, and I ask senators to allow their colleagues to hear the answers to questions so they may be debated after question time. <laughs> Senator Rustin, have you con continued? Uh, Senator Rustin's concluded her answer. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Today, the UN Secretary-General, Antonio Guterres, called on the world to make peace with nature and to address the climate emergency. He said, quote, the state of the planet is broken and humanity is waging a war on nature. Secretary-General Guterres has called on nations to be more ambitious. The planet is already sick. The Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, meanwhile, is fiddling around with dates in the second half of the century to reduce carbon pollution to net zero. The goalposts have shifted. Net zero by 2050 is no longer enough. Does the Prime Minister know this? Does he understand that we need net zero by 2035 or earlier? And what is the Prime Minister doing to address this crisis and this war on nature? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President, and um, look, I, I thank Senator Hanson Young for the question. It is tempting to refer her to the answers that I've given during the course of the week to, uh, to Senator Waters, and, uh, and I forget which other Green senators have asked almost identical questions. I think Senator Faruqi uh, asked a very similar question. Senator Rice. So, Mr. President, let me again remind the Green senators. Uh, in relation to Australia's position that we have committed very clearly to the Paris Agreement, to reduction targets under the Paris Agreement, and to deliver those targets and indeed strive to exceed those targets as we have done in relation to our commitments under the Kyoto Protocols, Kyoto Protocols 1 and Kyoto Protocols 2. Our effort to date in terms of emissions reduction 
is real and world class in terms of the level of those emissions reductions. If you take examples of reductions between 2005 and 2018, Australia has achieved 13 per cent reduction in emissions. Compare that with others, Japan at 8 per cent, the United States at 10 per cent, New Zealand at 1 per cent, Canada at 0.1 per cent. Our emissions reduction activities have been clearly delivered and our approach is to continue that. You asked about plans. Our approach is to continue to achieve those reductions through our investment in technology rather than the type of taxes or other mechanisms that the Greens, of course, would love to see applied. Our approach is to back technologies, to work with counterparts around the world like the United States in terms of investment in technologies along our tech roadmap, to build upon the partnerships we've struck in new technology areas like hydrogen with countries like Germany, like Japan, like Korea, to drive investment in those spaces and to achieve positive outcomes that continue that track record of Senator emissions reduction. Order. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Well, it's this type of faffing around, lack of action, that the general secretary calls is suicidal. That is the truth here. What is your government going to do? We need net zero well before 2050, and you don't even have a proper 2030 target. What are you going to do? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, we're going to keep implementing the policies that have been driving down Australia's emissions already. I just outlined the extent to which Australia has been achieving real reductions in our emissions relative to 2005 levels compared with other countries not meeting the same scale of achievement by Australia. What are we going to do? Well, over the next decade, our government will invest $18 billion in low emissions technology. Out of that, we're going to leverage $50 billion worth of new investment. This is all about getting the technology points like hydrogen or carbon capture and storage or otherwise to the financial tipping point where they are not only used and adopted in Australia, but they're economically viable for other countries. Because you know what? We're not going to see transformation in terms of China's emissions or India's emissions or other countries' emissions without cost-effective technological solutions. That's why we're investing in it, to get solutions here that can also be adapted in other countries around the world to fix what Order. is actually a Senator global Birmingham, problem. Senator Birmingham, time for the answers expired. Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Will the government cancel the surplus Kyoto credits as countries like the UK, New Zealand and Germany have already done? Or will you continue to, uh, so they cannot be used now or in the future? Or will you continue to hide, to squander and to faff about while the planet burns? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, let, let, let me try to give a little bit of an explanation about why it is that Australia has surplus credits. Uh, yes, you know why we have surplus credits, Mr President? Because when it's come, when it's come to the first Kyoto commitment period, we overachieved. We overachieved. We made a commitment to the world that we would reduce our emissions, Order. and we did so not only by the margin we promised, but by more than that. And that generated a surplus. And guess what's happened with the 2020 target, the second Kyoto commitment period? We made a commitment to the world again that we would reduce our emissions. And we met that commitment. And we overachieved. We overachieved for a second time. And so that is why Australia has carryover Order. credits. You know what other countries do? Other countries don't achieve the emissions reductions in their own country and go and buy credits from elsewhere around the world. We've achieved the reforms in Australia, overachieved. That's why those credits Order, exist. Order, Senator Birmingham. Senator, order. Order. Senator Sheldon. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Cash. Can the Minister confirm that Qantas has received more than a billion dollars in taxpayer-funded support since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, including hundreds of millions of dollars of JobKeeper wage, sub wage subsidies? The Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Sheldon for the question. Senator Sheldon, what I can confirm is that we're in the middle of a global pandemic and that many industries across Australia have been hard hit. And I do acknowledge that the aviation sector in particular 
has been hard hit. And as a result of that, you are correct. The government has provided industries and employers with support, whether it's by way of JobKeeper or the plethora of other policies that we have put in place. I am also, like you, Senator Sheldon, and like my colleagues on the government side of the chamber, we are saddened with any job losses as a result of the global pandemic, and including those job losses that have recently been announced by Qantas. Without a doubt, without a doubt, it has been a tough year for the aviation sector. It has been a tough year and a long year. And in particular, as you know, Senator Sheldon, because of the fact, because of the fact that our international borders remain closed and our domestic borders are only now really reopening up, and they will continue to reopening, are we seeing more flights in the air? But Senator Sheldon, our government, we have taken extensive action, as you know, to support the aviation sector to the extent possible, bearing in mind, bearing in mind the extent of the global pandemic. And in fact, Senator Sheldon, you would be aware that support to Australia's avi aviation industry now totals more than $2.7 billion. But like any industry or in Australia and employers, you are right. We have, as a government, provided them Order, with Senator support. Cash. Senator Sheldon, a supplementary question. Despite receiving more than a billion dollars in taxpayer support, Qantas has outsourced a further 2,000 jobs. Does the government support this decision by Qantas? Senator Cash. Uh, well, Senator Sheldon, again, the government's been very clear from day one. Any job lost as a result of COVID-19 is an absolute tragedy. Order. But this is a decision, as you know, it is a commercial decision for Qantas, and Qantas are entitled to make those decisions. But, as I've also already said, I have some statistics, Senator Sheldon, in relation to stand-ups and stand-downs. This actually shows the effect of the global okay. pandemic on the aviation industry, but also what we're seeing. As borders reopen, aviation companies are able to bring, as you know, their staff order. back Senator on. Order. Senator Wong on a point of order. Uh, uh, actually, the question related to outsourcing. I'd ask the uh, commercial order. decision. Okay. Um, have you concluded your answer, Senator Cash? Senator Sheldon, the final supplementary question. Since March, the government has allowed Virgin to fall into administration while giving Rex millions of dollars in untied grants, enabling them to expand their routes, given some aviation companies access to JobKeeper while abandoning others like Donata workers, and sat back while Qantas has sacked a further 2,000 workers. What does the minister have to say to the Qantas workers in the gallery and the building today who have lost their jobs? Senator Cash. Uh, well, Senator Sheldon, as I have said, as the Prime Minister said, as my colleagues have said, any job lost as a result of COVID-19 is absolutely devastating. The aviation industry has been hard hit as a result of COVID-19, and that is why the government has provided extensive support to the aviation sector after what I acknowledge has been a very long and a very tough and a very difficult year. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr President. My question is for Senator Payne, Minister for Foreign Affairs. Will a prisoner swap between Australia and Iran, as happened last week, start a new trend of Australia negotiating with terrorists? moving away from the proclaimed position of never negotiating with terrorists. The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President, and I thank Senator Roberts uh, for his question. Last week, Australia uh, was able to welcome the return of Dr Carly Moore Gilbert uh, to Australia 
after more than two years in detention in Iran. These are deeply complex, uh, very difficult matters to deal with in any uh, international context and even further complicated by the impact of a global pandemic. Australia worked for many, many months across two years to secure the release of Dr Carly Moore Gilbert and a range of diplomatic discussions and exchanges between international partners uh, are held at times such as this to pursue those matters. I will not go into further detail on those issues, but I am very pleased to be able to say to the Chamber that it is an enormous relief to have been able to welcome Dr Carly Moore Gilbert back yeah. to this country yeah. last week. Yeah. We know that Dr Moore Gilbert was imprisoned order. in Senator Iran. Senator Roberts on a point of order. Yeah, Senator. point of order, Mr President. I asked about the proclaimed position of never negotiating with terrorists. Um, Senator Roberts, you had a preamble, um, and the minister is being directly relevant to the question um, in addressing that part of the question as well. Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. President. Uh, as I said, uh, we never accepted the charges upon which Dr. Moore Gilbert was purported to have been uh, detained and ultimately sentenced, uh, convicted and sentenced. Uh, in that context, we continued our negotiations. We will not go into the nature of diplomatic discussions with other countries. Uh, our role is to protect the rights, the freedoms, the safety of our citizens in the national interest, uh, and that is our absolute focus. We consistently advocate in favour of the international rules-based order, and we fundamentally oppose coercive diplomacy in any of its forms. Senator Roberts, a supplementary question. We too are concerned about preserving the rights and freedoms of Australians, and with that in mind, if more Australians are taken as hostages again in future, how many more terrorists will Australia need to set free to gain their release? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President. We are very concerned about the use of arbitrary detention in a number of places around the world. We have engaged with international counterparts in relation to those matters, particularly uh, counterparts in the UN Human Rights Council uh, and in the United Nations context. I'm working closely with my Canadian counterpart in particular uh, on these issues. And it is always a matter of concern when Australians travel to countries where issues such as this uh, also are referred to in our travel advice explicitly and openly. Uh, we recommend strongly that Australians who seek to travel to such places, notwithstanding the fact that the current travel advice continues to be do not travel in the context of COVID-19, we recommend strongly that that travel advice is read uh, and observed. We form the advice through Order. our consular and Senator crisis Payne. division, Senator. Senator Roberts, a supp final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Does this promotion of Australia's release of three terrorists in a hostage swap constitute providing support to a terrorist organisation, which may constitute an offence under section 102.7 of the Criminal Code Act 1995? Senator Payne. No, it does not, and I reject the premise of Senator Roberts' question. Senator Mackenzie. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison McCormick government's economic and health response to COVID-19 is supporting Australia's employment and economic recovery? The minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I thank Senator McKenzie for her question. I know her concern for uh, Australians right across this country, city and metro and regional, uh, in terms of their health and economic well-being through what has been this most remarkable year around the world. And indeed, Australia has and continues to perform better than most other countries in terms of saving the lives of Australians and saving the jobs of Australians. It's been an incredibly tough year for many people across Australia and an even tougher one for many people across the rest of the world. But yesterday's national accounts have shown that in Australia, real GDP increased by 3.3 per cent, the largest quarterly increase since 1976. Of course, it came off the back of a significant decline in the previous quarter. However, when you look around the world, the decline Australia faced was less than most of the rest of the world, and the recovery is stronger 
than most of the rest of the world. And these are the defining factors. It is a work that is ongoing work. It is going to be a long road back for all countries around the world in terms of the recovery from here. But over the last five months, we've seen 650,000 jobs created, 344,000 of those filled by women, 226,000 filled by young Australians. We welcome this incredibly important progress in terms of getting Australians back to work and the decline in the effective unemployment rate from 14.9 per cent to 7.4 per cent. Our economic recovery plan outlined in the budget this year are programs to enable profitable businesses that are previously profitable for loss carrybacks, our investment deductions, our bring forward of tax cuts, our plans around home builder are all about the next stages of recovery over the months and years ahead to keep getting more Australians back into the workforce and to drive those numbers back to where they were in the past, Order. back in Senator the future. Birmingham. Senator McKenzie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you for that comprehensive answer, Minister. How has the government's record economic support through the COVID-19 pandemic protected Australians' livelihoods and kept Australians connected to jobs? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, $257 billion in economic support from the government, $130 billion of it already flowing into the pockets of households and businesses, has been crucial to maintaining and keeping business capability, businesses afloat and therefore, of course, Australians in as many jobs as possible. Programs like JobKeeper, the Job Seeker Supplement, the Cash Flow Boost to Businesses, the two $750 payments to millions of pensioners and others on income support. These have all been crucial support that have kept almost 3.8 million Australians connected to their employer. The Reserve Bank estimating at least 700,000 Australian jobs saved that would otherwise have potentially been lost without these types of programs in place. Our supporting apprentices and traineeships wage subsidy has helped over 57,000 small and medium businesses to save again around 100,000 apprentices and trainees to keep them in jobs. Crucial saving of jobs Order. throughout Senator this Birmingham. year. Senator McKenzie, a final supplementary question. Thank you, uh, Mr President. As Australia enters a new phase of our COVID-19 recovery, how will our Liberal and Nationals government support Australians back into work, back into training and empower local communities, including in regional areas, to deliver tailored responses to our communities? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, so many of our programs have been supporting right across the economy and the country, but our local jobs program is putting boots on the ground across 25 regions targeting particular support uh, for employment, funding local jobs plans in collaboration with local stakeholders, employers and training organisations to help make sure the jobs growth in those sectors and regions is as strong as we are trying to drive right across the whole country. Our job maker hiring credit benefits right across the country, supporting 450,000 Australi young Australians back into work. Our uh, boosting apprenticeship commencements, wage subsidy, will help support the training of a new generation of 100,000 apprentices and trainees across Australia, but especially in regional and rural Australia, giving these apprenticeships and young Australians maximum opportunity to get a job in the regional areas, to stay in those regions, to contribute to their growth and their opportunity, and ultimately to generate even more jobs into Order, the future. Senator Birmingham. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Senator, I refer to the generous offer from the New Zealand Prime Minister to resettle refugees and people seeking asylum who have been detained by your government on Manus Island and Nauru. After over seven years of misery, suffering and uncertainty for thousands of innocent people who have committed no crime, Will your government finally accept this kind offer from Prime Minister Ardern and give people the freedom and safety they so desperately need and deserve? And if not, why not? The Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President uh, and Senator McKim. Uh, you did mention uh, Nauru 
and Manus Island. And uh, just for your benefit, because clearly you've forgotten why uh, people are on Nauru and Manus Island. So just to, just, to, just to remind you, Senator McKim, it is because you supported the failed border protection policies of the former Labor government. You see, colleagues, when we came to Point of order. Senator, um, Senator McKim on a point of order. Uh, well, predictably, it's relevance, President. And, and yes, the word Nauru was in my question, but uh, the history, the sordid and shameful history of Australia's offshore detention policies is not relevant in any way. Um, I order, I'll make the rulings if people don't mind. Um, on the point of order, a small amount of historic context is directly relevant. It would not be appropriate for it to form the bulk of the answer to the question, nor a substantive part of the answer to the question. But I think it is reasonable to have some historic context, but to be directly relevant, it must, direct, it must directly address a substantive part of the question. So you've reminded the Minister, Senator McKim, and I call the Minister to continue her answer. And thank you, Mr. President. And as I was saying, the only reason Senator McKim is able to ask his question today is because he supported the failed policies of the former Labor government. Senator McKim, in relation to though the New Zealand refugee resettlement offer, um, the Prime Minister and the Minister for Home Affairs have made it very clear we appreciate the offer from the New Zealand government to resettle refugees. However, as you know, Senator McKim, we remain focused on completing the United States resettlement arrangement. You clearly know the answer. You're sitting there shaking your head. The US arrangement, Senator McKim, for your benefit, is actually progressing well. It is actually progressing well, with 876 refugees resettled to date and further departures expected in the coming weeks and months. Senator McKim, a supplementary question. Thank you, President. Minister, why is it that uh, your government insists that the US arrangement must run its course before engaging with the New Zealand government in response to their offer. Why must people wait longer than the seven and a half years that they have already been detained? Has your government not heard and does it not have the capacity to walk and chew gum at the same time? Senator Cash. Uh, well, unfortunately, Senator McKim, in answer to your question, and colleagues, I'm going to have to go to the uh, the statement or the question by McKim, does your government have uh, the ability to walk and chew gum at the same time? Well, the answer is yes, Senator McKim, because clearly we showed that when we came into office and we actually stopped, we stopped the boats coming. Because you see, Senator McKim, you supported failed policies. And as such, when we came into government, we had to clean up the mess the mess that you created. Just let me remind you, Senator McKim, 50,000 people arriving on more than 800 boats, 1,200 lives. Senator Hanson Young will remember this well. 1,200 lives tragically lost at sea. Over 8,000 children were detained whilst Labor uh, were in office uh, in government. In, to, in July 2013, just to remind you, Senator McKim, 10,201 people in detention, including Senator McKim. Order, almost Senator Cash. Time for the answer children. has expired. Senator McKim, a final yes, supplementary um, Thank goodness for that, uh, President. Um, Minister, I note the findings of the Australian Human Rights Commission's report released today, which notes grave concerns for the physical and mental health of the 196 refugees and people seeking asylum who were transferred to Australia from Papua New Guinea and Nauru for medical reasons. When will you finally give these people freedom and safety and end their prolonged and heartbreaking suffering? Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President. Well, the Morrison government, we, are, we will never apologise for protect, protecting Australia's borders and restoring integrity to our borders. We will never apologise for that, Senator McKim. In relation to the report that you refer to, uh, you'd be aware that the Home Affairs Department has responded to it um, and has agreed with nine of the Commission's recommendations. But, Senator McKim, what you also, what you also failed uh, to advise the Senate was the Commission importantly notes that the reduction in the number of children in detention, uh, which peaked at almost 2,000 under those opposite, that, that the Commission actually acknowledges that reduction. Um, 
Mr President, this is also what Senator McKim has failed to tell the Senate. Um, overall, we've reduced the number of people in detention by 85 per cent, more than 10,000 under your alliance to just 1,500 now, and more than 70 per cent of those in detention, Senator McKim, have a criminal record. Senator Keneally. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Yeah, yeah. On the 18th of September, the Prime Minister promised that 26,000 stranded Australians registered with his government at that time that they'd be home by Christmas. Can the Minister confirm that in the 76 days since the Prime Minister made that promise, only 14,000 people on that list have made it home? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and uh, thank you, Senator Keneally, for uh, the question. Mr President, uh, the challenges for many Australians overseas are well appreciated by the government. This is a very difficult time, and the impact of the pandemic uh, is not, as it would be easy to say or think, uh, past. It is, in fact, uh, a matter with which many countries around the world continue to grapple with at the most difficult level now. So the health and the safety of Australians abroad and at home has been the government's number one priority in these difficult and unprecedented times. We are very aware that many Australians face hardship overseas because of the global travel restrictions that are resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic. And we are helping vulnerable Australians, Mr President, by facilitating access to flights to Australia by providing financial assistance where required through the hardship program which uh, we announced some months ago, by continuing to provide a professional and responsive consular assistance to those in need. Since the National Cabinet meeting Mr. President, on 18 September, where the Prime Minister indicated that of the 26,000 uh, Australians uh, then overseas, we would endeavour to bring as many of those Australians back to Australia as we could, we have seen 40,800 Australians return from overseas, including more than 16,000 Australians registered with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Of those, over 3,500 were described, uh, were uh, categorised uh, as vulnerable. Mr President, since uh, the government advised Australians to return, more than 432,000 Australians have returned Order. to Senator Australia. Payne. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you. And I note the minister's response that 16,000 of the 26,000 have come home. Given that the Prime Minister's only got seven days for the 10,000 stranded Australians who were registered with DFAT on the 18th of September to be with their families on Christmas Day, what hope do, the, do those 10,000 stranded Australians have that they'll be able to celebrate Christmas with their families in Australia? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. And let me just clarify, Senator. I said that since uh, the National Cabinet on the 18th of September, over 40,800 have returned from overseas, including more than 16,000 Australians registered with DFAT. That is not necessarily specifically of the 26,200. There will be a component of the 26,200 plus others. Uh, I will get the Senator. I will get the Senator that uh, that other number. Mr President, I know that Senator Keneally uh, and those opposite uh, have uh, been uh, discussing uh, these issues for some time. In fact, I understand Senator Keneally's uh, um, interview with Mr Fordham this morning uh, referred to this. And it is clear that the, uh, those opposite do understand the process of national caps uh, and the management of the quarantine and the number of arrivals that, that restricts us in dealing with in Australia. And we are working closely with the states and territories in relation to that, uh, Mr. President, because Order. we know what Senator happens Payne, when quarantine goes answer wrong. Senator has expired. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Dave and Kate Jeffries have been stranded with their young son, son Mitchell, in Canada since their return flights were cancelled in March. They've had their travel plans disrupted and their flights cancelled multiple times. Will the Prime Minister deliver on his promise to the Jeffreys family to have them home by Christmas, or will he leave them behind? Senator Payne. 
Thank you very much, Mr. President. We are doing everything that we are able to do within the flights available, the quarantine places available within the caps, to bring as many Australians home as we can, Order. as many as we can. Order. And since that meeting on the 18th of September, 40,800 Australians have returned from overseas. I very much hope, Mr. President, that families such as the one that Senator Keneally has referred to are able to do that within, and we will continue to provide them with appropriate consular support through this process, because it is a very difficult situation, Mr. President. We are dealing with, as I have remarked before and as I know others have remarked, a global pandemic which has impacted our ability to, re to return Australians from overseas. It's impacted by flights, it's impacted by quarantine space. We have opened Howard Springs. We have, have accommodated 500 Australians in How Order. returning Australians Senator in Payne, Howard Springs the as part of that expired. process. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Can the minister please update the Senate on a global search for a COVID-19 vaccine and how it will impact Australia's health response? The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Bragg for the question. And uh, I'm pleased to obviously update the Senate that the uh, Morrison government welcomes the emergency approval given to the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine in the United Kingdom. Uh, this is particularly so given the over 1.6 million cases and the tragic loss of over 59,000 lives in the United Kingdom. Uh, this emergency approval is not a full public authorisation. However, it does allow the United Kingdom government to deploy the vaccine as quickly as possible to specific groups of patients, such as frontline healthcare workers, people over the age of 80 and aged care residents. This emergency authorisation is in response to the very high disease load in the United Kingdom at present. Uh, it is understood that the emergency use authorisation, the vaccine, uh, will not be generally available to the wider United Kingdom population. Uh, in terms of Australia, Pfizer continues to work with the Australian Therapeutic Goods Administration, providing data for safety and efficacy as part of the approval process. Uh, our advice remains that the timeline for a decision on approval is expected by the end of January 2021, and our planning is for the first vaccine delivery in March 2021. Pfizer, of course, is one of four vaccines the Australian government has purchased for a total projected supply of around 134.8 million units. Uh, in addition, we will have access to up to 25.5 million units under the international COVAX facility. Safety is, of course, though, Mr. President, uh, our number one priority, and Australia is well placed both for a thorough but rapid safety assessment and early rollout of a free, voluntary but universally available COVID-19 vaccine program. Senator Bragg, a supplementary question. Should a vaccine Order. prove safe and effective, how has the government's vaccine strategy positioned Australia to roll out a vaccine in 2021? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, the Morrison government has made a $3.2 billion investment in advance purchasing agreements with four vaccine manufacturers, AstraZeneca, CSL, Pfizer and Novavax. We've contracted for, as I've already stated, uh, around 134 million vaccines directly, in addition to another 25 million units of vaccine through the international COVAX facility. This means Australia has secured enough supply to vaccinate Australia many times over, subject to success and approvals. Our medical experts have identified the class of vaccines that we need. The vaccines we have secured amongst the most advanced, and it is increasingly likely that all of our contracted vaccines are on the pathway to being successful, safe and effective. Australia actually has high vaccination rates, uh, with over 94 per cent of Australian five-year-olds being vaccinated each quarter this year. Order. Australia, Mr. Senator President, Cash. Senator well Bragg, positioned. a final supplementary question. Thank you. How will these investments continue to support Australia's unique response to the COVID-19 pandemic? And how is Australia positioned compared to other countries to face the challenges of COVID-19? 
Senator Cash. Uh, well, Mr. President, more than $18.5 billion has been committed to support the emergency COVID-19 health response to the pandemic. Uh, when we do look at, though, the situation here in Australia, compared to other nations, uh, we are performing remarkably well. Just in terms of a global update, uh, there have been over 63 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 globally and over 1.4 million deaths in total. In Australia, We've had 27,923 confirmed cases uh, and, sadly, 908 deaths. Uh, whilst we can never be complacent, the systems we have in place have resulted in lower loss of life, lower transmission rates and lower economic impacts than in most other countries. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Youth, Senator Colbeck. How many young Australians are unemployed? The Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator, uh, Minister for Youth, Senator Colbeck. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. Um, unfortunately, the, um, the youth unemployment rate is too, too high at the moment, at 15.6 per cent, Mr. President. And, and so, Mr. President, as uh, we have done through the uh, budget process, through the period of COVID-19, Mr. President, uh, we have put in significant measures. Mr. President, we have put in significant me measures to support to support young Australians. In fact, Mr. President, uh, it's it's interesting that the Labor the Labor Party were a few only a few weeks ago criticising the government for the range of measures that we have put in place to support young Australians to get back into work as the government. And, and, and as the economy recovers from COVID-19, Mr. President, so significant order. resources. Senator being Colbeck, I have Senator Wong, on, or Senator Green, on a point of order. Uh, point of order, Mr. President. Um, my question didn't have a preamble, and it was uh, directed at how many young Australians are unemployed. Uh, that's a question about a figure, not a rate of unemployment. Uh, with respect, I don't think it's within the, my ability to um, decree that a rate is not directly relevant. Um, there's a, a time to debate questions. The minister, the minister is entitled to order. The minister is entitled to answer in that form, and it was a very specific question. And I will maintain uh, a tight test of direct relevance because of that. As long as the minister is talking about youth unemployment, I do think that is directly relevant. Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, and 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 I believe I was being directly relevant to the question because I actually quoted the youth unemployment rate of 15.6 per cent, Mr. President, as part of my response to the question. Uh, Mr. President, uh, and, I, and I've also said that the youth unemployment rate in this country is too high. And, and the work that this government continues to do to support young Australians to, to, uh, to get back into work because we are concerned that young people who stay out of work too long have significant lifelong effects with respect to uh, their futures, their career, their financial circumstances. So, Mr. President, so we have made, through our budget processes and through the pandemic, in supporting people with uh, JobKeeper, in supporting young people with JobSeeker to keep them in, connected to their workplaces, and then to support them to gain new jobs through our job maker programs, uh, our su Senator, apprenticeship support Senator programs, Colbeck, Mr. President. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Uh, direct relevance. The minister has been asked for the number. I understand he's now being given the brief. Perhaps you could advise the chamber. As I said before, Senator Wong, I think answering in this form, I cannot say that is not directly relevant to the question. What I'm being asked to do is to rule on the substance of an answer, which I cannot do. While the minister is talking about issues directly related to youth unemployment, I do think that is directly relevant. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And so this government will continue to do everything that it can to get the 337,200 young Australians who are unemployed back into work, and we'll continue to do that. Order, Senator. Senator Green, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. I do have a supplementary, but I can assist the minister. The latest ABS data reveals that 337,000 young Australians are unemployed. How many of these? How order. Order. How sorry, how oh, Sen am sorry I order. Senator, Senator, Senators on my right, Senator Wong, one of your colleagues is asking the question. I heard multiple colleagues on my right. Is one of your colleagues answering 
asking the question. After you read out the number, could you? I'll let you continue the question if you could go, start from after you read the number again, Senator Green. How many of these young Australians are unemployed today as a result of the Morrison government's deliberate decision to exclude them from JobKeeper? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, this, this government has worked assiduously through COVID-19, through the development and the implementation of JobKeeper, through the development and the implementation of JobSeeker, to assist young Australians to uh, stay in work where they can, connected to their jobs, to support them through the COVID-19 pandemic. And Mr. President, unfortunately, the youth unemployment rate over the, the last period has increased. Uh, that's why we put in place measures, Mr. President, to assist young people to get work, to, us, to attract young people, to attract employers, to employ young people in apprenticeships, Mr. President. And only. In the last sitting fortnight, Mr. President, the opposition were criticising us for focusing on young people and employment as a part of our budgetary strategy, Mr. President. But we will continue to do that because we know the negative effects on young Australians if they stay out of work too long. We will continue to support them into new jobs Order, and, and assist Colbeck. the economy. Senator Green, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. 337,000 young Australians are unemployed and more are expected to join them in the coming months. How long will it take for youth unemployment to return to pre-crisis levels? Senator Colbeck. Mr. Mr President, as the economy continues to grow off the back of the, the release of the border lockdowns that have been occurring, we saw a 3.3 per cent growth in in the economy over the in the recent figures that came came forward last week, Mr. President, more people will go back into work, and they will continue to be encouraged to do by the measures put in place by this government, Mr. President, unashamedly put in place by this government, Mr. President. Measures that the opposition has criticised us for, measures that the opposition have opposed in this place, Mr. President. The youth measures that we put in place, criticised by the opposition. Uh, opposed in this place by the, the opposition, Mr. President, uh, but we are proud to support younger Australians and employers of young Australians to bring young people back to work. Senator Birmingham. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper, please. All yours. Ah, Senator Sheldon. Well, I rise to take note of the answer given by Senator Cash to the question I asked. Yesterday's national account figures are nothing to crow about. Our GDP is nowhere close to where it was a year, year ago. Investment is down. Consumption is still down. Wages are still stagnant. The Labor share of income has fallen to record lows. And there are still 2.4 million Australians either unemployed or underemployed. And the Morrison government is out congratulating themselves. And while millions of Australians are still hurting, the jobless queues are growing. And nothing has been done about the challenges of insecure work and underemployment. It is clear for many Australians what looks like a recovery on paper will still look like a recession. Just ask the 2,000 newly outsourced workers at Qantas, 2,000 Australian men and women with families right across Australia, now without work because of the heartless decisions of the Qantas board under the government's watch and the government's subsidies. Only a few hours ago, I stood with Qantas worker, workers like Sean. Sean works for Qantas as a ground crew at Canberra Airport and he has a wife and three daughters, three young daughters. He said, how am I to tell my three girls that you can work hard, but you can be replaced by a company that will pay people less? And this is happening on your watch, the government's watch, and with Australian taxpayers' money. No accountability, no control, no responsibility, to these companies and their actions that they're taking. You are abandoning hard-working Australians. 
Is this the economy that we want in Australia? These are jobs that will be go to the lowest common denominator, to companies who pay the lowest wages, jobs that will go to companies with lower conditions. The workers at Qantas will have to beg for their old jobs at lower rates and lower conditions. Because why? Because of Alan Joyce, the CEO's corporate bastardry, doesn't care about the workers that made the company the spirit of Australia. This is quite obviously not the Australian way. But if losing your job at an outsourced company isn't enough of a kick in the teeth, Alan Joyce and the board of Qantas have done this plan with the implicit backing of the government. Qantas has received more than $800 million in government support in tax relief and JobKeeper payments. All of it taxpayer money. Much of it the taxes of many of thousands of Qantas workers to keep the airline alive, to keep it flying, to keep these jobs secure. Instead, when Alan Joyce and the board chose to abandon these workers, they did so taking Morrison's money and running for it. They did it with the Prime Minister not saying a word. The Prime Minister and the government have abandoned these workers to lower pay and lower conditions, all the while patting themselves on the back that we are technically out of a recession. The government is crowing about comeback. Well, these Sir Qantas workers want a comeback too. They want to come back to their jobs at the same rates and conditions they worked hard to earn. The road to economy, to the better economy and recovery, is getting longer and longer every day that the Morrison government ignores the catastrophe in the aviation industry. First, they let Virgin fail, leaving thousands of workers without jobs and the corporate raiders to pick through the scraps. Then they abandoned the workers at Donata, retrospectively denying them JobKeeper with a cruel stroke of a pen, a mistake that the Treasurer could fix this afternoon with just another stroke of that pen. And now the workers of Qantas, more than 2,000 everyday hard-working Australians, abandoned by this government. Only a few weeks ago, this chamber passed a motion calling on Alan Joyce and Qantas to stop this madness. Of course, did they listen or did they care? No. Is this the future economy in Australia? One where businesses take from the public purse in one hand and with the other sign away thousands of jobs without a thought to the cost to their workforce and fellow Australians? And the government turns a blind eye to a blatant act of corporate bastardry. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Senator Stoker. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. And can I start with a tone that is a little bit different to what we often employ in this chamber during Take Note, often a time for uh, theatrics and drama and witty slurs across the chamber. I, so, speaking of slurs, um, Senator Sheldon's given us a fine example of precisely the kind of behaviour that isn't appropriate when we're talking about the families and who, who are suffering the consequences of a commercial decision that Qantas has taken in relation to making staff redundant. Now, it's important, um, and I notice that Senator Sheldon is walking out of the room in in Senator a debate Stoker. that he, he pretends, Senator he pretends Stoker, may I remind you that during this time of remote participation, the president did ask senators not to reference whether particular senators were in the room or not. Right. Well, um, perhaps I will instead frame it this way. While I was willing to give Senator Sheldon the respect of listening to his contribution, I hope he will listen as. Um, sincerely and in the heartfelt fashion um, that this important issue deserves. I've got my doubts, but nevertheless, any job lost is a disaster. It's a disaster for the people involved and it's a disaster for us here in the coalition. And it's part of the reason that the Morrison government has put so much effort and so much of the public's resources into trying to keep businesses strong so that they can keep on their staff. And whether we talk 
about the cash flow boost, whether we talk about JobKeeper, whether we talk about the instant asset write-off, whether we're talking about programs like Home Builder or JobMaker. We are trying to make it as easy as possible for people to keep working people in work. We know that when businesses are strong, they can keep their staff on, and that gives the certainty families need to get through this time of uncertainty. I understand that anxiety. We all do. That's why our every effort is going into building that economic strength and resilience. But the difficulty I have with the arguments made by Senator Sheldon just a moment ago is that it takes a small piece of the puzzle and ignores all of the other interconnected parts that go into whether or not a business is able to keep staff on. And he's happy to talk about how we must at all times have rising wages. And he's happy to talk about how we must at all times have all people in secure work. All wonderful goals. But if we don't look at the context in which that occurs, it's actually pretty ignorant. In circumstances where those opposite have fought tooth and nail for zero flexibility in the workplace, they have fought tooth and nail to deny businesses the chance they need to be able to move people around or change the way they do things, shift people into different skill sets to try and get through hard times and emerge stronger, more able to offer the kind of high wages and security that is desirable, when they've stood in the way of those important measures every day that they have served in this parliament, going back decades. Uh, the issue of industrial relations is one that gets nothing but obstinacy from those opposite. Well, they need to confront a really uncomfortable truth, and that is that by their very obstinacy, their very refusal to countenance any kind of flexibility at any time, it is those very policies that tend to sign the redundancy papers for good people who deserve jobs. Because the fact is, businesses need to be able to adapt to difficult times, and this is one of them. The failure to adapt, the failure to provide a business that's struggling to cope with it with the ability to shift gears, to survive hard times, that is what ends the opportunity for vulnerable people like those who are in the gallery to keep on in their jobs. And so instead of standing here and grandstanding, Senator Sheldon and his colleagues should apologise to the Qantas workers who've been let down by inflexible and unreasonable industrial relations attitudes from those opposite. And I call upon those opposite to get into, um, to get into a mental space where they confront the reality of this difficult market for aviation, the difficult market we all face in COVID, and start to take a Team Australia approach because the prospects of business survival are actually compatible with the positive prospects of working people. Thank you, Senator Stoker. Senator Stirl. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, I've got to tell you, I've heard some uh, contributions in this joint that was one of the worst. And I'll tell you why, Senator Stoker, no, seriously, before you start slurring this side of the chamber, I'll throw a challenge out to you, through you, if I may. How many enterprise agreements I've negotiated over the years, how many negotiations I entered into as not only a delegate as a long distance owner driver but also as a union organiser in 28 years on the job. How many men or grown men, Senator Stoker, have you had in your office on Friday night bursting into tears when they found their job go down the road? So how dare you? How dare you use that language? How dare you try to mislead those that may be listening or reading and the Qantas workers that this side of the chamber need to apologise for standing up for working men and women? That is one of the worst contributions and I will debate you in every city, every town, every yard, every shop floor in this nation. You will not win. You will not win. You are so mischievous Order. the way you dare try and insinuate that the Qantas workers' wages was the reason they got the big A. Why, they didn't even get a meeting or a letter. 
You know how they got the sack? Are you aware, Senator Stoker, because you're so well informed? No, you've Senator got no Stirl, idea. Senator I just remind you to make your uh, remarks to the chair. Thank sure, you. And through I the remind chair. Other senators Do that you know? You have no idea they got an SMS. Now, before we start talking about the disgraceful rates of pay that Qantas workers demand, they were negotiated over the years. They were negotiated by the workers on one side, represented by their unions, and by management on the other side. You know why? Because I've been in the room for a number of them. Qantas EBA Mark III, Qantas EBA Mark IV. They weren't, there, there was no gun to their head, Qantas. They did it. But you see, Senator Stoker, you need to understand, these jobs are still there. Your government has thrown taxpayers' dollars out like confetti to Qantas, 800 million for JobKeeper, over a billion dollars all up. Your government, and you know what Qantas are doing? They're giving this. Oh, I nearly did that. I won't do that. Sorry, Chair. They're giving you this, right? This is what they're saying to you. Thank you very much. Because we're not only going to get rid of the workers, we want their jobs to come back with uh, companies that will pay not even Australian standards. They won't pay the superannuation guarantee charges that we are seeking. They will fight like hell. And you make it sound like Qantas are going broke. Guess what, Senator Stoker? And I'm not allowed to say this as she walks out the chamber. Oh, ah, you no, hypocrite. No, what hypocrisy. No. You couldn't wipe Senator the bag Stirl, out other senators. Senator Stirl, it is not I OK to wait. take no, poetic licence. So, I'm just, sorry, Madam Deputy okay, President. But hypocrisy really, you know, rank hypocrisy with me really gives me a nut in the guts. And there's a classic example. Now, Qantas, Madam Deputy President, have actually said they're going to be in the black in two months. So what does it take to get through the head of that side of chamber? Qantas have used a pandemic for the opportunity to outsource jobs that are there and will be there as the borders come down and we kick in. And you watch all the flights come on the screens next week. You watch all the flights coming for Christmas. And dare I may ask, check how much it cost all of us to get here to Canberra, because we all probably came on Qantas, I don't, unless the ones that drove. Check the prices that Qantas are charging us to go home. Make no mistake about that. They're having a ball. They can't help it. They're rubbing their greedy hands together. Oh, but they won't have any skin left. But I've got to tell you, my disdain for Mr Joyce, Madam Deputy President, is not a secret in this place. I've had many, and you were at one of my inquiries when, we, when he shut down the airline. Oh, remember that magnificent piece of bastardry for the Australian, not only the Australian travellers, worldwide Aussies trying to get home. Oh, we forgot about that. But he's got eight other accomplices. He's ably backed up, and I am calling for their, this mob must resign. Joyce must lead the charge and resign because there's no guts on that side. The Prime Minister's lacking guts. He's too busy flicking money with his hand in hand with uh, uh, Mr McCormack for their mates at Rex. But I'll tell you what, what about Richard Goiter, the chairman? Why should he escape scrutiny while he's on his $584,000 of Qantas's money? Qantas's money, not earned by the greedy board, by the 30,000, Madam Deputy President, you used to represent Qantas workers, and your great union stood up for Qantas workers for many, many years. And you know the negotiations we've had. $584,000. Goiter, Mr Goiter did not make Qantas great. The workers made it great, but he couldn't wait to get his claws into the till. Ably backed up, as I said, by Mr Joyce. Maxine Brenner for her $364,000. Jacqueline Hay, her $211,000. Belinda Hutchinson, and she gets an AC, I don't know what for, $283,000. Michael Lestrange, there's another set of initials and in AO, $223,000. Todd Sampson, that's the last time I'll ever watch him on TV. What a, hip, what, a, what a state of hypocrisy that fella shows. And there's Anthony Tyler, Barbara Ward and Paul Rayner. What a terrible, terrible situation. 2,000 families going into thank Christmas. Thank you, Senator Searle. Your time has expired. Senator Rennick. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. And um, I would like to continue uh, the remarks there of Senator Stirl, because he's, he was right in, in the uh, conclusion of his uh, take note speech that he actually started to point the finger in the right direction, and that is the Qantas board. Now, he mentioned a name there that didn't probably get enough prominence, but I'll, I'll, I will bring that name to attention because I think it needs to be mentioned. Uh, this uh, 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 Miss uh, Barbara Ward, uh, who just happened to be a senior ministerial advisor to wait, wait for it. Who was she a senior ministerial adviser to? Former Prime Minister Paul Keating. Former Prime Minister Paul Keating. Now I wonder if I wonder if this is her 30 pieces of silver for privatising Qantas. 
because that's the thing here. And I've, I've been consistent about this. I, I talked about privatisation wasn't the right thing to do in my maiden speech. So you can't call me being hypo, uh, uh, hypocritical about this, right? But, you know, the privatisation of Qantas was facilitated by superannuation and the industry funds who wanted to privatise everything so that the Labor Party and the unions could get control of industry. Well, guess what? You've got your people on the boards now, and one of them just happened to be a senior ministerial advisor to Paul Keating. Now, if you want to take it out now, I'm, you know, I'm not, you know, I, I, you know, I don't want to start going into it, but you know, at the end of the day, Alan Joyce is there at the behest of the shareholders and of the board. Now, I did have a look at the top 20 shareholders, and unfortunately, they're all nominee holdings, which I'm working on because it really annoys me that I can't see who owns what. Um, but I'm keen to actually, if you're keen on this, Senator Stirl, I'd be keen to find out who are the biggest 20 shareholders in the real names, not nominee accounts. But I suspect if you were to drill down into who the shareholders of Qantas are, I suspect a large deal of them would be industry super funds. I'm not having to go here, but seriously, if you want to do something about this in a constructive manner, um, I, I suggest that you find out which industry funds own Qantas. Uh, I'm talking about jobs. I'm getting on to jobs, right? So if, if you want to do this, and you, you, know, you, you guys now have got control of industry through your industry super funds, you need to speak directly to the uh, industry funds. Because that, as government now, we no longer own, we no long, longer own Qantas. And I spoke about this in my maiden speech. There is no accountability. Okay? Who can the people be accountable to if infrastructure is sold? Okay? Because you can't sit there, because it was the Labor Party that sold Qantas. It was the Labor Party that sold Qantas. And to be fair, and I've got a lot of time for you, Senator Stirl and, and uh, Senator Gallagher, um, it's a bit rich to come in here and have a go at us because we've been trying to help people get through the COVID crisis. Okay? Now, you know, we drew a line in the sand because we didn't want to subsidise uh, foreign-owned companies. Um, and, you know, look, I, I've been actively trying to get Qantas to relocate to Queensland so that it's cheaper, the costs are cheaper. It's cheaper to live in Queensland. You know, it was started in Queensland. It's not the New South Wales and Northern Territory Air Service, it's the Queensland and Northern Terri Territory Air Service. And the first time I met Alan Joyce, I said, when are you taking Qantas back home? Because that's where it belongs. And let me tell you, if it's back in Queensland, it'll be a lot cheaper to run. It'll be a lot cheaper to run. And we should also bring home QBE as well. Um, so I... I I, I totally empathise with the fact that these workers have been outsourced. I hate outsourcing. And if you actually read uh, Chapter 12 of Machiavelli's The Prince, it says never outsource. Never use mercenaries, never use auxiliaries. And I've always subscribed to that. In my own work experience, whenever we outsource, it always ended up uh, in a terrible situation. However, what, what I will rebut in this take note is the fact that the government doesn't care about the welfare of working class Australians. Of working class Australians. And that is why today, we stood up and we were happily to, happy to push back on what Labor seemed to think we shouldn't count those carbon credits that were earned fair and square, fair and square by the Australian workers, particularly the agricultural sector and particularly South West Queensland, who, as I mentioned yesterday, is doing it tough because we're locking up mulga paddocks. And I'll tell you what, your old mate Barry O'Sullivan would be you know, uh, choking on his soup if he knew that you know, we were, what we were doing to great towns like Charleville and Quilpie and Longreach. You know, the home, long reach, I should add, the home of Qantas. Um, so before we get, you know, start argy barging for the sake of argy barge, I'd just ask to reflect on this. Someone owns, those, uh, owns Qantas, go to the shareholders, go to the people who control the company, control the board, and I agree with you on Todd Sampson, I've got no idea what's he doing now, I don't know how this bloke got on there. Um, uh, and, and let's try and find a solution together. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Senator Green. Thank you. Today I got the chance to meet with Qantas workers uh, here in Parliament House and um, I asked them about what they usually do for Christmas. They um, are going to have a very different Christmas this year. Uh, usually on Christmas Day they go to work. They go to work so that other people can get home, see their families, spend Christmas with their families. But this Christmas they are looking down the barrel of losing the jobs that they have had for decades. They found out that they would be losing their jobs through an SMS. A TV screen came up 
with an automated message and told them that a decision had been made not to cut their job because the work didn't need to be done anymore, but to outsource their job to another company, to another worker. And I asked them, was there someone there to take your questions, to listen to you, to talk about these concerns, to tell you why this decision had been made? And there wasn't. There wasn't anyone at that company that was willing to stand up and listen to the concerns of workers. They left the room. So that's why we're here today talking about this decision and talking about it in reference to the decisions that the federal government has made in regards to the aviation sector. Because nobody here is denying that the aviation sector has had a difficult time through this pandemic. Nobody is denying that. Nobody is denying that. And Labor senators on this side of the chamber have been in here since the start of this pandemic calling for support from this government for our aviation sector. But what we are saying is that if you are going to deliver $800 million of taxpayer funding to a company, to Qantas, then why would you give that money with no strings attached? Why would you just hand over this amount of support, the support that was greatly needed to make sure that people could continue to travel and that those jobs could be saved. Why would you do that and make that decision without telling workers that this funding would save their job? Because it hasn't. All of this support that this company has taken from the federal government with no strings attached. Because what we know is that these jobs are being outsourced. They are not being cut. The company has made a decision to make these jobs less secure, to make sure that these people can't unionise, don't have annual leave, probably won't know even when their shifts are. They've had 10 years of loyal service to a company, and let's face it, to Australians, because they have been the ones getting you home when you need to go home for Christmas, making sure that you can spend time with your family, getting you there safely, getting you there safely because these workers care about safety. But this outsourcing decision will make sure that the people who stand up for safe conditions at aviation won't have the same job security that they have at Qantas. So yes, we are asking the government, is that acceptable? Do you support that decision? And they can't say that they do. They couldn't possibly say that they do because if they did, they would have to admit that they gave this, this company billions, hundreds, $800 million of support, of support without thinking to attach a condition that this company didn't outsource jobs, didn't outsource jobs. And I just want to make sure that those opposite, because they crow a lot about supporting regional jobs, that they know that this decision will result in 50 jobs being cut from the Cairns Airport in regional Queensland. 50 jobs from an, ec from an economy, from a community that has already suffered enough. Already suffered enough. These jobs will become more insecure. And this comes after previous, previous redundancies resulted in about 90 jobs being lost from the Cairns Airport. As I said, no one is denying that this has been a difficult time. But when these, when these uh, workers come here and when they rally outside MPs' office, all they've got is basic denials that this government is prepared to do the tough thing and the hard thing to stand up for their jobs. That's Thank all you, they're Senator asking Green. you to do. Thank you, Senator Green. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Sheldon to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. I rise uh, to take note of the answers from uh, Senator Birmingham, uh, representing the Prime Minister in this place today. Uh, the answers that uh, he attempted to give in relation to my questions. Of course, today uh, we've seen the Secretary General, uh, Antonio, uh, Antonio De Ke 
Sorry. Today, we've seen from the Secretary General of the UN, Antonio Guterres, a very dear and very sobering warning of the situation that the world faces right now. The Secretary General, Guterres, has told the world that we need to lift our ambition urgently, quickly and seriously if we are to tackle the collapse of biodiversity and the collapse of the climate before things really do get too late. He says that this is an epic policy test, but that ultimately this is a moral test. He says that if we continue with the denial that action does not need to be taken urgently, that we can push things off to the latter half of this century, that we are risking suicide that it would be suicidal to continue to deny the actions science tells us we need to take. Secretary Guterres has called for countries to take more action and be more ambitious in relation to our 2030 uh, emission reduction targets. He's called on us to do whatever we can to make sure we meet net zero emissions. And rather than going with a 2050 target, it's quite clear that if we are to tackle the climate crisis, the extinction crisis and the death of this planet, we have to bring forward that target to much, much earlier. The goalposts have shifted. Debating about whether 2050 is the appropriate time frame for net zero emissions, we've missed the boat. We have to make that decision much, much earlier. It needs to be at least 2035, if not earlier. And yet we've got our government here refusing to engage in a proper strategy and the action to reduce our pollution, to help address the climate crisis in the timeframes that we have left. We have 10 years to take action. The UN's dire warnings today should not simply be dismissed. And in fact, what we're seeing now is that countries right around the world are focusing their minds, sharpening their action and are forcing countries like Australia to justify our ignorance. There is nowhere left to hide. We've just had, of course, the very clear message sent from President-elect Biden that we need to come to the UN conference next year in Glasgow with a much more ambitious attempt, commitment and action to tackle climate change, to reduce carbon pollution. We now have the head of the UN saying that if we don't do this, we risk the death of the planet. He says that the state of the planet is broken, talks about the impact on food security, on conflict, that it is now climate change that is not just risking the health of our environment, more extreme weather, an expansion of deserts and the choking of our oceans, but that it is going to be climate change that is the biggest driver of conflict around the world displacement of people and the conflict that flows from that. I asked the minister representing the Prime Minister whether this government understands how dire this situation is. I asked the Prime Minister, through Senator Birmingham, whether he understood that we needed to get to net zero emissions by at least 2035. I asked the Prime Minister through Senator Birmingham whether we were going to improve 
our action to, towards 2030 and have a more ambitious target. And I asked the Prime Minister through Senator Birmingham whether the government would rule out using Kyoto carryover credits. On all three of those questions, the minister refused to answer. And why? Is it just ignorance? Is it because they're too busy faffing about, they don't understand their own policy? Or are they just hoping that if they continue to turn a blind eye to the facts, that the crisis will somehow disappear? We need climate reality Thank from you, this Senator government, Hansen and all we've your got time is climate. Expired. So the question is that the motion to take note of answers is moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Patrick.